Thank you, Lenny. Let me take a minute to thank the audience, the student volunteers who've run TEDx today, certainly our speakers, Sharon, Suzanne, Stephen, Al, Owen, and Leanne. You've all done a great job today and a nice sunny afternoon. Thank you for your participation. I made two conscious decisions today to reduce risk. I will not be using PowerPoint slides. <laughs> and I have prepared my remarks. I hope one of those two decisions is correct. TEDx is a unique event that engages us all in thinking about the future and our place in it. It is appropriate that Binghamton University should be part of TEDx because TEDx is a form of public education. Which brings me to the topic of my talk, the Cloud Grant University, when higher ed meets high tech. Being new to the presidency here, I've been thinking a lot about the role of the public university in society. And as many of you might know, in 1862, the Morrill Act created land grant universities in the 19th century by setting aside land for the purpose of building public institutions of, of higher education. Specifically, the act provided for the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes in several pursuits and professions in life. This was a revolutionary idea. The act captured America in transition as industry replaced agriculture as the basis of our society and made American higher education the envy of the world. It spawned amazing institutions. But this model is 150 years old, the product of a different era, I believe it is time for a new model, the Cloud Grant University. The Cloud Grant Institution recognizes that today, primary drivers of economic power and social change are not just our minds, farms, and factories, but information. Students must be technologically proficient. Higher education needs to evolve to meet these needs. Not that education has ignored technological change. In fact, over the years, education has embraced every innovation in communications technology. There were correspondence courses conducted through snail mail and CD-ROM lessons on the first computers. One can picture Socrates grasping a bullhorn and thinking, now I'll reach my students. But none of these innovations fundamentally changed or addressed how students learn. Learning has largely been a passive experience until now. Advances in communications technologies, especially the internet and social media, are making learning an interactive process. In my three decades as a professor and a teacher, I have seen firsthand how technology can change the dynamics of the lecture hall. The first thing I learned about how students learn is that almost everyone needs personal attention from the instructor, and that won't ever change. Technology still can't provide that pat on the back the quizzical look, and the occasional kick in the pants that a real live professor can offer. But technology can facilitate learning and contribute to what the professor does in the classroom. So while I harbor significant reservations about classes that are taught entirely online, I am a strong proponent of hybrid classes that combine face-to-face -face teaching with elements of online coursework. As a professor, I was an early adopter of technology in the classroom. Eventually, I reached the point where I was recording each of my lectures and produced a textbook with examples on DVD. I also encouraged students to use learning materials available on the internet because there was no reason for students to spend hundreds of dollars on information that is available for free elsewhere. I even developed my own online alternative to Blackboard, the internet-based course management software that most universities, including Binghamton, use to manage course information. What I discovered is that when used wisely, technology can significantly enhance learning. Here are three ways that technology improves learning. First, it can streamline the classroom processes, such as taking attendance, clarifying reading assignments, and doing away with my favorite question, is that going to be on the test? Second, it adds flexibility. The old model classroom learning used a one-size-fits-all approach for both students and the material being taught. There was an assumption that all students would be in the classroom at the same time each day, and that the 50-minute lecture was the right amount of time for all lessons. But we know that's not always the case. Students are older. Some are juggling families. 
may be working one or even two jobs. In fact, the traditional residential student is becoming less common. By 2015, just three years from now, there will be five million fewer 18-year-olds in the United States than there were in 2008. Technology enables us to bring education to new groups of students by making school conform to their lives rather than having their lives conform to school. And third, technology enhances student engagement. Technology can help students become part of the learning process. For example, iClickers, which lets students vote on the answer to an in-class question, gives the shy student in the back of the lecture hall the same opportunity as the eager student in the front row. Social media, such as Twitter and Facebook and class wikis and blogs, help students access materials outside the classroom, providing a way for those who are reluctant to ask questions in class to participate in the discussion. More significantly, these venues allow students to develop their own peer learning networks with faculty serving as moderators, sharing questions, developing answers, and working as a team. I found that the use of technology in my classroom changed the traditional dynamic between the professor and the students. And it caused me to rethink some of the normal structures of my class. Because the online component made my classes flexible and more engaging, I didn't require attendance from students who received A's on the first exams. Some students could use their time more productively if they could demonstrate mastery of the materials through online learning. But if you are doing it right, students will want to immerse themselves in the entire learning experience. As one of my students posted on Rate My Professor, lectures weren't required, but you find yourself going anyway. I also found that technology does funny things with time in classroom. For students, it both stretches and stops time. Students viewing recorded lectures can freeze and repeat aspects of lessons until they master the material. Salman Khan, an internet education pioneer, has produced more than 3,000 educational videos that have been viewed more than 125 million times. He likes to say that video reverses the traditional educational paradigm where time is constant and knowledge is the variable with grades reflecting how much a student understands. Conversely, video can provide students with information in digestible chunks so that every student can gain mastery of the information. And another advantage of hybrid education for students is that it brings the classroom to the student rather than the other way around. Students can learn anywhere, in their dorm rooms, their parents' basement, even in a military base or a research station on the other side of the world. Because students access information from the cloud, time zones no longer apply. In fact, judging from statistics of internet usage on our campus, students might actually prefer learning at 12.30 at night rather than 8.30 in the morning. Hybrid instruction creates a time shift for the professor as well. In recording my lecture, lectures using narration feature in PowerPoint, a very simple technique, I found that recording compresses time. The 50-minute lecture I taught for years was only 25 minutes of material. Those recorded lectures didn't shortchange the students. In fact, they were more comprehensive and more focused than traditional classroom lectures and offered a compelling lesson in how much of the traditional classroom lecture is filled with tangential information. More important because students could view the lecture on their own time, I could spend more time thinking about the structure of the course, deciding what I wanted students to learn, and developing classroom exercises that stressed concepts rather than simple statements of fact. Classroom time became a time for discussion, for questioning, and conceptualization. Many of the advantages that technology gives students, the ability to communicate re remotely, to rapidly access and analyze information, also applies to the research and scholarship that faculty are engaged in. The development of learning communities among students is mirrored by online research and teaching collaborations between scientists from different universities and industry. At Binghamton University, technology is rapidly transforming many other student-faculty interactions. Roughly one out of 10 of our classrooms have distance, lear distance learning capabilities, meaning lectures can be recorded and uploaded to the web for viewing. Video conferencing is frequently used for thesis and dissertation defenses, where either the student or faculty members are at a remote location. 
I have even heard that our music department has used teleconferencing for an assessment of one of our violin students. You can imagine that this required extremely high resolution of both audio and video to assess intonation and dynamics, finger work, and playing form. By 2014, just two years from now, half of all students in the United States will have at least some hybrid classroom experience. But the development of technology resources on campuses raises a number of challenges. How do we ensure that students and faculty are capable of using these technologies? There is an assumption that all students are born with a smartphone in one hand and a computer chip in their brain, but the truth is that some students, especially the adult students for whom distance education is most suited, can be intimidated by the technology. And of course there will be some faculty who are opposed to technology or who have no time for dealing with new platforms with a steep learning curve. So it is imperative that the people developing these platforms focus on making them intuitive and easily adopted. Can we develop a campus infrastructure to support the technological university? As public universities, do we have a responsibility to provide access to data-rich learning materials for students? Are our responsibilities the same whether a student lives in a dorm on campus or is living in an apartment 200 miles away? And if so, what infrastructure needs to be developed? We are already struggling with these issues on campus. One of the biggest technological challenges we face is maintaining broadband access. Binghamton has greatly expanded its delivery capabilities. It has grown by 43% over the past two years. Still, internet usage has doubled in that same period so we are close to capacity during peak hours. Binghamton is delivering 800 megabytes per second with a peak capacity of 1,000 megabytes per second. But sometimes we have to cap and limit download speeds for things like video. This is not the best solution when what we provide students is increasingly composed of digital information. Clearly, technology promises to radically transform higher education with advances increasingly blurring the lines between virtual interaction and real-world communication. So what will we see in the next 10 or perhaps 50 years from now? Karen Bromley, a distinguished professor in Binghamton's Graduate School of Education, has written about the future when students won't use pens and paper and even keyboards will be a thing of the past. Communications will be verbal, verbal and visual with audio translators creating printed materials and video providing presentations. And even a la Isaac Asimov, instead of diagrams on chalkboards, there will be three-dimensional holograms and immersive experiences. And someday, perhaps computers, if we're still calling them that, will be a source of artificial intelligence that can take the place of teachers as we know them now. We are at the beginning of a journey with no certain destination. What I am certain about, however, is that hybrid education will be an increasingly important component of higher education delivery for decades to come. Its virtues, increased flexibility, greater student engagement, and the reduction of routine administrative tasks enhances the classroom experience for both students and our faculty. It promises to increase access to information for students while offering new pedagogical tools for our faculty. And in this era of fiscal uncertainty, it promises to reduce instructional costs while increasing access for students. And to e increase access for all students, the United States needs to deliver on a pledge that it made a year ago called the National Broadband Plan. That plan set ambitious goals for developing access to high-speed internet across America with a target of ensuring that all American families without service have access to fast and affordable internet service with a particular purpose to provide access to education. It's an admirable proposal, and it's gone nowhere so far, to providing nationwide internet access to higher education in the 21st century. It's time to take the land-grant college to the next level, the Cloud Grant University. Thank you.